big night for you tonight, huh, bud? Absolutely. Can't you see him? <laughs> I'm relaxing. Usually you rest in the green room in a director's chair. I've got this uh, comfy lounge chair that I'm getting ready for. Yeah, big night. Yeah, the great, uh, the great one's in, huh? Gary Reynolds, how lucky am I to start an endeavor? And it doesn't matter what you're starting here in Northern California. If you're opening a pizza parlor, it doesn't matter what you're doing starting a talk show. You got to get Jerry Reynolds there. And I'm very fortunate that he decided to stop by. You nervous? Well, a little bit. It's the first show, man. Come on. Are you kidding me? Aren't you nervous? This is the first show, the Phantom Talk Show on the Stones Radio Networks. The only thing I'm nervous about is being on time. I think it's time to go, bud. All right. I got to get out of here. Oh, man. <sighs> All right. Here we go. Good luck. Thanks. I'll need it. Right here, I think. Oh, yeah. Coming to you live from the Stone Studios, it's the Phantoms Talk Show. Filmed in front of a live studio audience of one. My Jews have been Mr. Basketball. Yes, and, we'll talk about and, that, year. And uh, certainly I have no gender reveal. I've been more or less a man, as far as I know. More or less, I think, time. is the key. Yeah. What exactly are you the goat of? Is it prep reporting? Is it high schools? Is it college? What is? What are you? The, you're definitely the goat. But what up? What? What's too far for mom to no, drive? No. And I want to get outside because I had one of those. Who goes, <laughs> I think Fullerton's far enough away that mom can't come on, come on a Thursday. A bar, a restaurant, whatever it may be. Something to find. <laughs> I like how you money. go lessons or working at a bar. It's, That's it's one or the other. Yeah. It's one or the other. Like, way. You really didn't pay much attention to me. So I thought, well, maybe I can make Tom laugh and I, maybe I'll get on the country show. <laughs> on the show tonight, the great Jerry Reynolds. And now, the guy you've all been waiting for, it's the Phantom. Welcome to the Phantom Talk Show. I'm Phantom. And you know, if you're going to start anything in this area as we are at the Stone Studios in Roseville, California, you're going to start a uh, talk show, you're going to start to open a restaurant, you got a gender reveal, doesn't matter what it is. If you're going to get a guest, there's only one guy you can get to launch your uh, your endeavor. And uh, fortunately, this guy not doing anything very much uh, around, I guess, because he said <laughs> yes as soon as I called him. Jerry Reynolds is my first guest. Jerry, thanks for coming by. Well, uh, I'm happy to do it for you, you know, since I've always admired you as men, Mr. Basketball. <laughs> Yes, and, we'll talk about and, that, Jerry. And uh, certainly I have no gender reveal. I've been more or less a man, as far as I know. More or less, I think, time. is the key. Yeah. And we'll talk yeah. about Mrs. Reynolds as well. But it, the thing of it is, is you're such a gracious guy. And every, anytime we ask you to do something, you're always, uh, always there and saying, sure. But then you always undercut yourself by saying, you don't have anything to do. Is that is that the plight of Jerry Reynolds these days? You know, it isn't exactly. I mean, I do have things to do like anybody does, you know, but a lot of them are health related. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, that's, brother. that's the problem, you know. It's yeah. like, yeah, I don't want anything to do. And as time goes on, and of course, I've been lucky to be involved in several podcasts, as, right. you, as you know. And then, uh, you know, just being around Mrs. Reynolds, she finds things to fill the day. Yeah, we uh, do a podcast on this uh, same channel, you and I and the radio superstar Whitey Gleason. And something you referred to yourself uh, at one of our episodes, you called yourself a regional celebrity. And I think I thought it was, first of all, you might be selling yourself short, but I think you definitely are a celebrity. So how did you come up with the regional celebrity tag? You know, it was one of those things, I can't remember before I first heard it, it was... Uh, somebody that was kind of a kind of a celebrity in a yeah. certain area you right. know and he caught, had and somebody said yeah he's just a regional celebrity <laughs> and i thought well that's pretty cool and that's uh you know uh, i always remember my dad back in french lick he was just there was a guy named ed calais he was a sports guy on channel three out of louisville easy, easy ed calais did they call him easy ed? no they oh, just no darn. just ed would have been good but but i mean the reason I, i'm bringing this up is my dad you know, he might as well have been Rock Hudson. You know, because <laughs> we you saw and I know who we, that is. Yeah. We we saw Ed Calais at the Kentucky State Fair or something go by, and I mean, my dad is you know really it'd been if it'd been Babe Ruth or anybody, it wouldn't have been any big. Did he chase Ed? No, or no, he, he wouldn't do that. Him? Even my dad would be yeah. that. But but I mean, Ed was truly a regional celebrity. Now people in a fifty mile radius, right. of Louisville, Kentucky, all knew who Ed Calais was. And uh, so, anyway, that's kind of... Well, it's just, uh, I mean, the celebrity part is true, actually, though. And I, I was wondering, you know, 
the celebrity part, I mean, you were always known as a coach and everything of the Kings back in the day, but I think the celebrity part might have come with the, the broadcasting career. And I just wondered, I mean, you're a very gracious guy anyway, but did you realize celebrity kind of means something? I mean, we throw it around a little bit, but it really you can have impact on people. And I was wondering uh, when you realized that. Well, I, you know, that's a great question. I mean, and I do agree with you. I think probably more people knew me from broadcasting mm -hmm. than anything to do right. with uh, coaching and all that because it's such a different era type thing. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and, and then, of course, young people, they grew up with me where they weren't, exactly. you know, as a broadcaster. But, you know, uh, like I say, that was always kind of interesting. But I, I think there's another thing. For years... I did a lot of uh, uh, commercials for Chuck Swift Dodge. Yes, you were a pitch man. Yes. I was a pitch yeah. man. And so, you know, I probably did that for seven, eight years. And then uh, I'm trying to think of a couple others I did. And, you know, the reason I say that brought me probably more into the public a little bit was because the commercials would be on every channel. Right. I mean, the Kings are on one channel. Yeah, but you were all over the spectrum. Yeah, right? you yeah. know, it's one of those things yeah. Yeah. that, uh, you know, was, I always thought kind of interesting because there'd be people come up to me and want to talk about, i seen you on the, on the commercial. Right. They didn't really care about the Kings. No, but that's exactly what I'm trying to talk about, though, Jared, because they'd come up and they'd see you, and your interaction with, with them was critical. And I was wondering, you know, I mean, you could just, you know, you're a, a nice guy all the time anyway, and you talk to people all the time anyway. But I was just wondering, like, yeah, when tell you, Mrs. Reynolds that, would you? I will tell you, Mrs. Reynolds. We'll get to her. Don't okay, worry. Okay. I just wonder when it became – when it became, you kind of realized that, hey, you know, what I say to these people, the way I act to these people does have impact, and I kind of have a responsibility to kind of, I mean, like I say, you would do it anyway, kind of a responsibility to act a certain way or, or be a certain way because that they expect me to be a, a certain way. Well, you know, for me, I, I just always thought it, you know, if somebody wants to talk to me or right. wants to get a picture or autograph, it's it's an honor. I mean, you know, it's like, that's my, I that's mean, exactly I certainly my point. didn't grow up in, you know, and outside of French Lake, Indiana, thinking, boy, someday somebody's going to want my picture. You didn't think you'd be easy Ed Calais. No. I didn't know. No. I, I, I would, would have, that been my highlight. Would have been if awesome. I could be Ed Calais, yeah. that'd be, that'd be ultimate for my dad. That, but yeah, so, so, but you know, the, uh, it's kind of funny because the celebrity stuff, I always tell people it's true. I was a coach at Pittsburgh State uh, University mm -hmm. in Kansas for one year before I came with the Kings. I just went down there one year and we, we had a really good year, turned you know, but it was it was interesting because they had a local TV station and we had our games on TV, right? Had oh, a, a little nice. little coach's yeah. show, and then more importantly, you know, we we had like say a lot of success where where the school had never had, and all of a sudden the, the grocery chain in town started putting my picture on the on the grocery bags. On the bags? On the bags. You know, like you, you know, you get your groceries. <laughs> I still got some of them. I got to see those. Just, <laughs> but, was there a, did it say Jerry underneath or was it just well, your Well, you got to have my picture. Just and, plaster and, on know, the side. Yeah, and then uh, I think the uh, team schedule and stuff like that. That's a nice promotion. Well, yeah, I didn't get anything out of it, but. <laughs> well, that's a recurring theme, right? <laughs> yeah, that's Through a recurring the theme. They just did it. But, uh, but anyway, <laughs> but the, my point would be, and you're wondering where it is, is that, I was, you yeah. know, I could, in that area, there's very small, 20,000 right. people in town and a 7,000 enrollment school. Uh, but, you know, I couldn't go anywhere. People, you know, honestly, way worse. Were you the grocery bag guy? Were uh, you the yeah. coach? What were you? Oh, yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. I mean, there wasn't anywhere I could go that somebody didn't want to more so than any time in Sacramento. That would be great. If your team was bad, people would wear bags over their heads and they, have they, your face yeah, on they, them. They, you know, if I'd stayed there long enough, that probably would have <laughs> that happened. definitely would have yeah. happened. Well, I was getting at all of that with, just to talk about how gracious you are to people and how, how good you are to people. But uh, I think people all know that. But they, when people hear that I'm on a show with you or that I know you a little bit, they always ask me three things. First of all, they want to know how old you are. Mm -hmm. Secondly, is he really that funny? And third, is Mrs. Reynolds a figment of his imagination? Did he just make her up? So let's 
let's go in order. Yeah. You're 79. Is 79. That correct? Coming be, in on 80. Be 80 in January, late yeah. January. So, I mean, that that's so we'll put that aside. You're put 79 that aside. in mind, and you're yeah. comfortable with 79. And that's not just really, the but that's what I am. You know, not it's a damn kinda, bit comfortable. It's kind of it. like bottom line, I'm 79. 79 it, it doesn't really matter. Considering the alternative, as far as I know. They, that, yeah, as far as you know, they ask me if you're as funny as you are when, when you're on TV, and I say, no, he's much funnier in real life. You know, because obviously I get the X-rated version. You know, yeah, I mean, we yeah, get, yeah, we you get, get the stories. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the funniness is right there. And then third is the whole Mrs. Reynolds thing. And I kind of wanted to dive into that a little bit if we could. And you know, we've had we've done shows as we set up podcasts, and you talk about Mrs. Reynolds before, or after the show, or sometimes during the show, and give us a little bit of glimpse. But uh, from what I'm able to glean from you, this is a high school romance. And we have to go back all the way to French Lick, Indiana, right? No, but is not it, in not in French Lick, Indiana. It's college it started. Oh, it's college. Okay, yep. so mm-hmm. now, so you were at one, you were both at the same college. Well, it was a, there is a story there. I, I thought was, there was a little conflict. I somewhere. was I was a, an assistant coach my first year at Vincennes, and uh, I, Mrs. Reynolds was a student. There now, we obviously, go. Okay, that's frowned upon because, but I was. 22 years old yeah and she was 21 and she laid out of school and worked a couple of years okay you know, so, so she, she was a gap little year. yeah yeah and so anyway we uh actually the the head of the physical education department at the time really basically brought us you know said you ought to date you know it, it, so it wasn't as frowned upon as it might have sounded when you hear about it first no well no. It, i mean and and you know at the bottom line is i mean we've been married 55 years so i, I would think it's proven to be okay i think it's worked out okay i mean yeah. maybe maybe you could well let's go back a little bit then a little bit back because i love to hear you talk about your high school days in, at french lick right yeah. now uh, now am i wrong there are two high schools in french lick two competing high schools no there, there's Two high there. Well, there's two little towns called French Lick, Indiana, okay, and, that's and you. West Baden, Indiana, is okay. really attached. They're right together. Okay, like Yuba City and Marysville, kind of well, like. Well, that. even closer, if okay. anything. And that became Springs Valley High School. Oh, at some point. In other okay. words, they used to be the French Lick Red Devils. I love the names. And the West Baden Sprudels. Okay, and they were, uh, you know. Born enemies. I mean, you know, right. if you played for French Lick, you wouldn't even drive so to West So smash the Sprudels is basically what they would say. And you were yeah. when you went to French Lick, it had not conglomerated into one school. It, it was not the until my, uh, well, actually my eighth grade is okay. when they consolidated. And uh, and so until then, you know, yeah, French Lick, Red and, Devils, and, Bruce, and, they yeah. were, and the West Baden Sprudels. And like I say, the, there is a, a sign that says you're, you're leaving French Lick and the sign you're entering West Baden right together. Wow, I gotta gotta check that out. Yeah, That's no, nice, I mean, I like and West Baden is yeah. like maybe a thousand people, and and then French Lick is about two thousand people. Okay, so, so so that's it, and then of course it's a huge resort. I always tell people that, and they never seem to believe me. They do in the Midwest because they know it. I love it. I remember you telling us about it. It sounds like a, a hot springs and everything there. Uh, well, the, yeah, it's spring. <laughs> it became famous for Pluto water, which is if nature <laughs> which, won't, if nature won't, Pluto will. as a natural will, will, laxative. Will, will. <laughs> and which, Wait a minute! It became known for laxative. It's a, the Pluto it's a, water. You go there, you soak in the Pluto water, and all of a sudden you're gone for an no, hour. No, you drink it. You don't soak <laughs> oh, it. Oh, you drink it. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it. And as far as I know, it works. I mean, I've drank some of it. It's, it was nasty stuff, for it. I was concerned. Did it do its job? It did. <laughs> it did. And you know, a big bottling. I think they just closed it down maybe 20 years ago. I mean, it went for. You know, it, it was a huge resort area for well, so since the twenties, talk- since the twenties, really. Yeah, so you're talking like hotels and stuff hotels, like that. Hotels uh, yeah. originally Golf in the twenties, and th- well, they have two championship level courses: wow. a Donald Ross oh, design wow. course That's amazing. and a Pete Dye design course. That's pretty sharp. That, I that's, mean, no, that's it's top big, notch. It's top yeah, notch. Top notch. Yeah, I I worked on the Donald Ross course when I was sixteen. Uh, I mowed bunkers and and raked the you, sand traps. That was my job. Okay. All okay. right. Very good. And, and coincidentally, one of the workers there, I think he, he did a lot of the cut the greens, was uh, Claude Bird, who happened to be Larry's granddad. Oh, man. Yeah. And I always say he, uh, he taught me uh, to not, how not to smoke. Uh, you know. <laughs> no, I, I, okay. So how did he? 
How did he go about that? Well, he was uh, he had another old guy there. They were close buddies. They they'd roll their own cigarettes. Right. You know, they had to roll them with one hand. One hand, yeah, yeah. And it's like, and then they'd smoke, and he's you know, and I'd say, yeah, yeah. I wonder how that is. You know, he said, well, okay. I'll. He roll you one. He rolled me one. Said, now if I roll it for you, you got to smoke all of it. You know, it was at lunch, <laughs> <laughs> and and I did, and that was about the last cigarette I wanted to oh, smoke. So, you know, I got. He did you a pretty big favor. Then, he did. In a way. He did. Yeah. I've told Larry yeah. that. I said, yeah, that, you know, I, I mean, that definitely curbed any desire I had to be to be a smoker. Now, did he try to, did you know if he tried to teach Larry how to smoke as well? Was there any of that going on? Well, Larry didn't smoke till he's yeah. like in his 50s. <laughs> okay, I don't know so why guess, in the world anybody would start in their 50s. Why would you start then? But let's go back further. So, at high school, you were the Caucasian Comet, right? It came to that. It's, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, uh, and which high school was it? it was Springs Valley. That was the that Congress, was the consolidation. The so you were the Caucasian comment. You've told us many of your exploits. And the question I want to ask you is, you know, I don't want to be uh, offensive or anything, but you're not a tall gentleman. No, I'm so, not. Uh, so at uh, five eight or five nine, I perhaps. Would, I always called myself five nine. I was really five eight. Okay, so five eight. I'm just wondering, were you one of those guys, uh, were the little guys with the chip on your shoulder? Did you go out there, uh, take the court, and you basically were like, I'm going to show you big sons of bitches, you know, that kind of a guy? I would say that would be a mild way of putting it. <laughs> so you were very competitive on the floor. I was uh, in a selfish little prick the whole yeah. bit. You know, I mean, I look back. I always say that's one thing that helped me in coaching. I could yeah. always spot the selfish pricks because I was one. <laughs> you identify <laughs> game knows game, yeah. Yeah, and uh, but, you know, it's like anything. When I went to college, and it, it, you know, basically a coach explained it to me a different way. Yeah, I was wondering and, about and, that. Yeah, and he said, you, you little blankety-blank, either you run the play the right way yeah. or you, you'll sit here next to me for right. – a couple of years. There's a lot of good guys when you get to the next level. Yeah, they don't and, really need you that much. You know, and I just thought, well, yeah, I'm open. I shoot. <laughs> yes. Uh, you know, feels like leather. I shoot it. That's Absolutely. the way it's always been. You, you started know. that. So, But did you keep, even though you changed your approach to the game later, did you keep the chip when you went into coaching? Is that something that kind of drove you a little bit? Not really. Uh, you know, I, I I hadn't even thought about coaching that much until mm -hmm. my senior year in college and I into student teaching and – I was, I was a student teaching at a little high school named Otwell uh, in southern Indiana, and and the coach, I'd known him since, you know, he's an older guy, but he'd coached against me when I was in high school, so he right. wanted me to student teach, and, and, he, want, and he started, you know, he, he wanted me to, to come there and be his assistant. Uh, okay. you know, he said you'd be really good at it, and I was really just teaching social studies and history and geography. So, it's, was that something that you wanted to be a teacher? You know, when the, you well, that to was my you were my a, real were, yeah yeah. Initially, my hero was a guy named Phil Summers, who was uh, at Springs Valley High School, and he came in and he was a, a so, social studies, history, mm -hmm. psychology teacher, and you know, and I just thought he's the coolest guy ever. You know, he's just right. right out of college, maybe a year out of college. I think he'd come somewhere else, and from uh, and anyway, and but I thought you know he he was single then, uh, had a <laughs> as you were as well. Well, yeah. no, but I mean, I was just looking at him. He you know had a little house in town. Yeah, you know. He could kind walk. of march to his own drummer, could, so to speak. Yeah, well, yeah. he could, you know, he spend his days at the local drive-in, you know, at night, and <laughs> had a used car, wasn't too old, you know, <laughs> wasn't too old, and he and he wore a suit, you know, back then when teachers oh, actually wow. okay. actually wore suit and ties right. to to work, which I mean, I know people wouldn't even believe that. Exists. No, that that could never have happened. But yeah. I mean, I had yeah. so much respect for him, and just uh, to summarize, he uh, later and he encouraged me to go to Vincennes as a. Mm player when I had some, he just thought it'd be the perfect spot he said you know he kind of knew me that as hillbilly as I was I'd got scared somewhere else right if, if I was more than you know an hour away from home yeah. and he and he was <laughs> you right. had to stay and, regional even then you're a regional celebrity yes <laughs> yeah I wanted to stay pretty close to my it was a small region yeah. then <laughs> but uh anyway uh so then later on he he went there as a gosh a, a financial aid director and okay. then later become the president of the university. Oh, so the, he's yeah. like kind of on the upward swing yeah. too. Oh yeah, he picked so, a good one. Well, yeah. when I yeah, when I uh, I think about my well, he wasn't president when I when I left there, but I always know you know I went back. I was lucky enough to get some different awards and mm. and uh, and so he you know he he was always very helpful to you know give me credit where 
maybe it's deserved or not. Is that one of your Hall of Fames? No, I know you're in several Hall of Fames. Y- yeah, yeah. The, it. Uh, yes, yes. <laughs> in a nutshell. <laughs> Which one was it? Well, you know, it. I don't know if they even call it Hall of Fame, but I, I think. Uh, but anyway, there's same kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. 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 So let's. You, you kind of. Uh, gone into that area let's talk about your coaching people don't know that much about your coaching career before you came to the Kingston so you started as a, a student assistant then well I, I started as assistant you know at, at uh, and then well, I was going to say you know I just I want to go through it briefly because I don't want yeah uh, we, we got a lot of things to cover but I was at Vincennes Junior College it's university they called it people always say well how would they call it university well because it was the first university in the state of indiana before wow. indiana university it was the capital of 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 the whole wow. uh, mid northwest midwest territories or something like i don't know not very good history <laughs> major there yeah but uh anyway uh was there for five years and you know recruited some good guys we had some success uh, uh, national junior then i went to west georgia university and Carrollton. I was there f- four years, and we took took several of the Vincennes guys with me. Mm-hmm. Uh, Putsy Walker, who later on played right. professionally. NBA, yes. Uh, uh, Tommy Terrific Turner was drafted. I had three guys that Tommy were drafted Turner, yeah. from Vincennes that I took with me. And, of course, really the best one, Bob McAdoo, sure. went to North Carolina. One of the best ones of any class, of yes, any player, any time anywhere, great. Yes. And then... Really, from there, I went to Rockhurst College, now Rockhurst University, because Cotton Fitzsimmons, who was Atlanta Hawks coach, mm-hmm. wanted thought it'd be a good move for me. Said they because the the uh, he knew the Kings practiced there all the time at the Rockhurst. At Rockhurst, and and he knew I had a real interest in the pros. I I didn't anticipate what happened, but he said. You know, that'd be a great spot for you. You can go there. So they haven't had a winning year in 13 <laughs> years, and so it'll be hard for you to screw it up. Yeah. <laughs> and, the and, floor is right there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And so, you know, I thought, well, you know, I, I did because I did that was something really intrigued me. And uh, Phil Johnson was the head coach at that time who I'd known when we'd gotten to be friends uh at, through Vincennes, and he was at Weber State. Yeah, so it's kind so of the like coaching kind fraternity of, yeah. kind of thing. So, yeah. so I knew I'd, I'd have a comfort zone with him, and he helped me get the job too at Rockhurst, and and so I could, which I did. I'd you know watch all their practices and and right. and, and and help sometimes with the veteran camps because it's, you know in those days you had one assistant. Yeah, and so when they like added 10 guys on every and they bring in you know twenty guys to mm-hmm. camp or. Or in Cotton's case, he'd always have a, a basketball camp when he became the head coach there. Okay. And so I'd work his camps and stuff at Rockhurst and take a little percentage. Uh, <laughs> hey, that's that's your business. You know, man. It wasn't near as big as his percentage, I'll tell you percentage. that. But. Well, let me ask you, when you're going through the coaching ranks, uh, you know, did you have like a, a Jerry Reynolds coaching philosophy? I mean, were you pretty malleable as, you know, you, you designed your – offense and stuff for your players or did you have your own way of doing things what was your uh, uh, approach through those years you know i always felt like number one is is you know get the best players you can get number That's one at whatever good. whatever yes. level it is because you know you know it's talent wins right to to a degree i mean you can coach them up a little bit and you can do some things but i guess if i had a philosophy was figure out who your best players are mm-hmm. yeah and then have an offense built around them. Okay. And then defensively find something, uh, the best defense you could play <laughs> with them. Because I'd always said, you know, it's like when I got to Rockers, which was pretty academically strong, and I really wasn't able to recruit some of the type, same type of players. You, yes. And so we became, we played matchup zone defense, and we became, you know, a very uh, structured team where we, you know, we try to win sixty four to sixty. Right. Because that was the talent that you had. Yeah, right. the best yeah. players yeah. I had. Yes. That's uh, the way they know, played. They, yeah, they weren't they really weren't any pro level players. Now I I had this you know, we were ranked became ranked nationally in the top ten for several years in a row, but they'd be guys who probably could have played division one. Uh so, you know, they were right. better than than the rest than, of the than the year, level so did we you go con- from Rockers then? Was to, that did th- you then to Pittsburgh State? So you had one more stop before you went to. Yeah, uh, I okay. just went to. I left. Reason I left Rockhurst is because the Kings quit practicing there. 
And that was a great relationship. That yeah, had well, it just, I mean, to me, it's like, well, you know, what's the point here? Uh, <laughs> There's no kings. And people feel that way all the time. There's no kings. I'm moving. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, and the other thing is I, I really didn't think I could win a championship there. It was, you know, uh, it was a small college in a city. Kind of limited were, in a way. Yeah. You just weren't going to get the attention, number one. You know, I mean, we we were really good, but a lot of games, you know, you just didn't draw. It wasn't like now where everybody – if you're playing a game somewhere in the United States, somebody's going to find you, and you're going to be on this channel, and you're going to be on yeah. that channel. Everybody gets noticed eventually. Yeah, and and like I say, but it it's probably similar to, I mean, you know, a, a William Jessup. Uh, what kind of crowds okay. do they get yeah. now? I mean, Rockers. Quite honestly, I don't mean to put William Jessup down, but as basketball, way better. Mm-hmm. <laughs> okay, know? all right. Duly <laughs> you know, noted. Probably, yeah. actually, yeah. I'd say that every year as a Rockers, we were better than in, any team at Sac State. Uh, okay. that I've seen. <laughs> so, I mean, it goes by relationships with William Jessup and Sac State, but that's okay. Just well, no, show, I mean, Jerry. I think the, the point is if you're going to compete nationally at the small college level, mm-hmm. uh, you're going to have to have Division One level players, and a lot of Division One low Division One teams don't have Division right. One level players. Exactly. <laughs> the bounce back players, so to speak. You yeah, see and that's what I'd get. I'd yeah. always get recruit the heck out of guys in the Kansas City area that were top players that mm-hmm. – you know, I knew I couldn't get them. Yeah. And they'd go to Missouri, Creighton, uh, St. Louis U, Kansas. And then if they didn't play, I, since I'd, you know, I'd have Here a good relationship yeah, with absolutely. them. I'd say, come come on back. We love you. And uh, <laughs> and you showed them the love before. Showed them the so love. They knew it was and, there. and they showed me some love by winning games. And you understood the numbers game, which is the, no matter how good they are, when once you get up to Missouri or Creighton, there's a lot of those guys there, and there's only five spots on the floor. Yeah. And a lot of them are going to get dissatisfied, and you were right there in case they did. Yeah, it's just like the pros. I mean, you bring in yeah. all these guys. They're all bit terrific players, you know, and they've been stars through high school, college, and they get to the NBA, and some are good enough to play. Some are Some are not, yeah. yeah. Some are G League. <laughs> yeah. And so, okay, so you have the relationship with the Kings from Rockhurst. Then you go to Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh State. Pittsburgh State, yeah. And then how did you make uh, the end around then and get back to the Kings? Well, the uh, basic is Phil Johnson, mm-hmm. uh, you know, because I'd always had a good relationship with him when he was a Kings coach, and then you know, even stayed in touch with him after he was let go. And, in fact, because uh, I'd talked to him periodically and stuff, and, and, you know, that he came in the year I left to go to Pittsburgh State, he came back as Kings coach, I think, a second okay. time. Yeah, all oh, right. He'd been a, a Kings right. coach earlier in the early 70s. He'd been, in fact, his NBA coach of the year one year mm-hmm. when Tiny Archibald and Jimmy Walker. That will help, yeah, yeah. Jimmy Walker. So, anyway, uh, he just – I always remembered because he he had always told me he said that, you know I, if I could ever ever get in a position to where I could hire a second assistant he said I'd like <laughs> to hire you well I mean people find that hard in, to believe in those days yeah yeah and uh, so so basically that's what happened he took the job and they said okay you can hire another guy and, you know they want somebody to do you know, advanced scouting as well as work with the team, right. scout pro, scout colleges. And In other bra- words, and, something and, they'd have four guys doing now. Yeah, you and, break were doing down, it all. And, yeah. and break down tape right. and stuff like that. And I did all that. And, you know, I, like I say, learned about five years of experience in one. Uh, so, but uh, but uh, the real story there was <laughs> the money. Uh, I was, I think at Pittsburgh State, I was making like, Thirty-five thousand. Okay. And and Joe Axelson. And this is 83, 84, 83, yeah. in there. Okay. And Joe Axelson called me and said, "Well, we can pay you uh, thirty-five first year and forty the second. Okay. And, well, of course, I didn't know that California. You know, I didn't know <laughs> there were a couple of different things you weren't different aware of things at the time. I didn't know. Yes. The the difference in prices. You know what I mean? <laughs> yes. This is a little bit different because <laughs> thirty-five thousand. In Pittsburgh, Kansas, you know, we lived large. You know, we had a beautiful home. And the know. mansion working and everything. Well, up an acre, acre, and probably I think twenty five hundred square foot. You know, you buy it for seventy thousand dollars. Yeah. Well, even today, it'd probably be two hundred. Yeah. Anyway, but that's not what happened when you get to California. Yeah. Right? So when I got right. to California, and this, you know, anyway, but I, I negotiated. My, this was typical of my negotiations. Yeah. I told Joe, well, that's 75000 for two years. Can I have thirty seven the first year and thirty eight the second? Because I wanted to say, so I can tell my wife. I got, get, a I got we, I we're got a raise. I got We're making more 
to go to California. So that's what we did. And, and so, yeah, then, you know, like I said, got to California and looked. And a little got, bit different. And got a house. And I always remember my wife saying, now, is this a is this a step up? You know, it's a great we, got a, we, I, we got a house half the size of what we had. I wanted to ask you about that. <laughs> I wanted to ask you about that too, because you've said on a couple of occasions that your wife was just as happy when you were coaching at the junior college level or anything as she was when you were with the Kings. Now, maybe some of that had to do with money, but uh, I mean that's a great attribute to have in a wife. That's like okay, this. This, I make the best of this, I make the best of this, and kind of followed you all the way up. Yeah, well, I, I mean, that was always the way she was. I mean, to her credit, she'd make it work. And, and I mean, I think the, you know, I mean, I think she enjoyed the NBA much more than after we got into it. Right. You know, settled in. But she never really got carried away with the NBA life. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it, you know, the old, everybody, you know, the players' wives and things that they're right. in the, in the, players room beforehands and you know and i got this ten thousand dollar diamond yeah, I and i got it i don't see that no you know and that no. wasn't you know she yeah, what's this all about you but know? was was uh, like when you were coaching at the smaller schools during college was it part of what she did you know with other wives other coaches and stuff like that uh was it part of what she did like a social kind of thing too yeah well she really you know had a good you know and that's what's so different i mean same way with my son he really enjoyed the college scene better than the right. NBA because, you know, the players really, you know, treat him different. Yeah, you know, I mean, uh, you know, yeah. I mean, it's like he he was kind of part of the team, and and then my wife, you know, was for the girlfriends or some wives. Yes. I mean, she could, you know, basically have great relationships with them mm-hmm. and help them, uh, just like you know, just like a college coach where you had really more impact on the players, yeah. you know, where you really felt like you could impact their lives. You got them earlier and, on, yeah. And, and help them. You know, right. they needed more help. Yeah, and absolutely. the pros, are no dis- they're adults, and, and they've got their mm-hmm. wives and families and agents. And they're, A whole it, entourage around And I them, think yeah. that was the thing that, you know, certainly I, I figured out quick enough. But, but I think, you know, w- w- took my son and wife a little while to say, Oh, yeah, they don't really. <laughs> no, it's it's not the same yeah, as I mean, it was in the old days, know, Dad. I mean, basically, yeah. it's like uh, whoever I wasn't playing, uh, they will get okay. <laughs> their their girlfriend and wife weren't really cheerful about it. Let's put it that way. That's a perfect window into what I want to talk about. But before I get to that, I just want to say you referenced it earlier. I've been living off you calling me Mister Basketball once fifteen years ago for the rest of the for fifteen years, and I just want to make sure you don't want to rescind that or anything. Is it? Am I still worthy of the the, uh, of the label i think you are you know oh, now you know my my people i, I deal with i mean you're talking about whitey and well, perhaps, and, and, yeah. and deuce mason yeah. and you know so yeah. it's a it's you know it's kind an of eclectic a, group you know I mean, uh, grant you know i mean it's like so did they say anything about my mr basketball well, or well, i think down? there's a little jealousy there but i they, can understand but that I, I think they but it's also true i think they know <laughs> I think they realized I deep down know. that I earned it. Okay, yeah. thank you, Jer. I wanted to talk a little bit about your time with the Kings. Obviously, just uh, you know, some of the stories that you've told us over the past years are fantastic, but you gave me a good start to that. Your wife actually got involved, from what you told us. Uh, she was not happy with who you were playing at center for a time. Do you remember the story you told us? Uh, Mr. Oh, Thompson? Well, yeah, she, I mean, it, it really didn't have a lot to do with who I was playing. Right. But I had a little episode, I think it was in Utah after a game, where LaSalle really came up to was really upset yeah. uh, about not playing more because I basically we were trying to uh, play Joe Klein since he was had been drafted there. Yeah. Of course, LaSalle had been too earlier, say highly. Right. And, uh, and like I say, LaSalle was, was upset, you know, and, and all. And anyway, and I remember calling my wife and saying, you know, I can't believe LaSalle, you know, was really upset. And she, I remember her saying kind of like, well, if he's upset, then you're wrong, you know, because he's he such that, a good, good yeah. guy. He's a really good guy. And, and of, course he, of course he was and is. Uh, Tank is just as good a guy as, as you'll ever find. And, 
you know, he was right. <laughs> he, <laughs> he was, was, he was right. He should have been playing more. He was a much better player than Joe. Uh, n- not that you're talking about we, Kareem really, Abdul-Jabbar either no, way here. No, but uh, as but, fans, we loved LaSalle back in the day, you know, yeah, the original yeah. Kings. Of and, the day. But uh, your wife, obviously, kind of a uh, microcosm there of what, you know, what made it work because all she needed to do was hear you talk one time and she just said well, straight knew, right yeah, away. I was going to say, yeah. yeah, she had a pretty good feel of those things. And, of course, like I say, not just – been married so long but i mean i worked for her for a while you know and oh okay yeah yeah she had a landscaping service back in uh in kansas city and fired me twice uh, what was the first problem well i started trying to tell her how we ought to do things <laughs> you oh <laughs> I no did. i did Women, I, I, she said I, well i'm the boss so you're fired and, and then you got your way back well i i reminded her i said you know it how can you fire somebody that sleeps with you? You know. Hey, hey, I, we don't need. <laughs> you know, <laughs> right. so, well, <laughs> really, we need to call HR. Where yeah, was HR on this? Yeah, yeah. well, there's a small. Co- it wasn't that big a company. And then but. she got fired the second time, hopefully because you were going off to do something different. Yeah, I yeah. think where I was just couldn't show up and do the work. Uh, I mean, really, I, just, I found reasons not to, right. I guess. But, <laughs> but uh, anyway, so but, that was. But I mean, that was you know. That was kind of that. I always say, you know, there's a lot of times I probably should have been fired in in basketball, right. but I never was, except for my wife. <laughs> my wife fired me twice. But so. you've told us, <laughs> obviously, with that landscaping background, you've told us in the last, you know, couple of months how your wife has all these projects at home, and she's just bringing bark home like crazy. So now I see where it comes from. Well, yeah, she, she originally, she was her plan was to be a landscape architect. She went, to I think, to Purdue one year to, to do that, okay. and then had transferred to the program at Vincent University basically and it, to go back mm-hmm. and but then by that time I was going to West Georgia and there was no landscape architecture right. program <laughs> no. and so she had to, she became a special education major and teacher okay. did that and 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 taught for years as well as a landscaping thing on the side. A landscape architect sounds really cool. Yeah, and no she, she I mean she had yeah. a lot of yeah. I mean went through high school working with companies and stuff yeah i was gonna say she well anyway yeah i was gonna say she was you know she was truthfully it always bugged me she was a better athlete than i was for she did she have the chip on her shoulder though like you did i don't think so i think that was probably her weakness she did she she probably didn't she was too you know she realized there was other stuff in life that she, was kind it, of important yeah too, you, you know? know she's you know it was she was good at it, but then nah, I want to do something else. You know. <laughs> All right, I just want to ask you a couple of things, Jerry. You've been so uh, so uh, good with your time. I have to bring up the time because I've heard you talk on the broadcast so many years about how you, when you know a player gets a foul or a player gets a technical foul and they go argue it, and you always say, "Well, I've never seen anybody get it taken away." So it's you know you know I don't know what he's doing, but you were actually assessed a technical foul. I was in the building. I remember yep. you were assessed a technical foul when you had your fainting spell, and yep. I think that was against Portland. Yep. And uh, it always makes me laugh and to think about it. Well, it doesn't make me laugh that you fainted, but I was in the stands watching, and I was just wondering how you felt the fact that the referee, he, he, I don't know what he thought about you, but as soon as he saw you go down, he thought you were making it up. Yeah. I mean, what, no respect from the refs or what well, was the deal I, with that? Well, I think I got the respect I deserved. I think there was – I did enough <laughs> – you did some history on it on the sideline. I did, I did some yeah. things, you know, you should be ashamed of, and I was, you know, after th- rethinking them. But, uh, yeah, I think Blaine Reichelt called the technical. He just teed you up. Teed me right up and, 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 you know, basically thought I was faking it. And then they did rescind it. Yes, you know, they did. And, of course, we won by a point. Yeah, Harold, Harold says he made the winning shot. He did. I, I always he, thought it was Eddie, but Harold said no, he made the winning Harold, shot. No, it was Harold, and we beat Portland, uh, you know, and, I, of course, they carted me off. And, and I always told Harold, I said, Barry, I went to a lot of trouble to make you a hero. <laughs> Yeah. I said, were you I, on the? Were you? You weren't back on the bench at that time. Or did you make it back? No, early? no. They took me to the hospital. So they just they just went without you then. Yeah. So did you think? Well, you know, yeah. there goes the job security. They're pulling out wins without me. Yeah. Well, they just pulled that one out, and I was <laughs> there most of the time. But <laughs> the next night, I mean, I think I missed the next game in Utah, and, yeah. and we didn't win. But, but yeah, that was kind of uh, you know interesting because it got a lot of national attention, yeah. and you know because of the. Fainting, you know, a lot of people faint, but they don't faint. faint. Not in front of seventeen thousand yeah, in the and, building, or ten thousand in the building. And national and audience, which yeah. it became, you know, yeah. a, a scene, and you know that sort of thing. And you know, I, I, you know, a lot of people thought I had 
heart problems. Sure. Uh, uh, I mean, it's concerning, I knew, obviously. We I, tease about it, but it's con- it was concerning, obviously. Well, I, 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 I kind of knew I didn't when I came to, <laughs> okay, you know. doctor. But, I mean, I didn't. But I also, you know, I knew there was issues yeah. because, you know, I remember the trying to talk about how red my face was and all that. And, of course, I've always told this story. It's true, you know, that when I first came to, I don't know how long I've been out, but Billy Jones, the trainer, was getting ready to give me mouth-to-mouth resuscitation. And, and I no, told that's him, a, no, that's a bad story. You can't. Uh, you know, I told him, I said, don't you put those lips on me, man. <laughs> Is that why your face was so red? <laughs> well, it reddened up. I don't know how, you know. But I had enough sense. So I you, mean, I had enough strength in my body to say, I'm not going to I'm not. Subconsciously, gonna you knew what was happening. So you well, had a referee that throws a T on you right away, and then you got Bill Jones wants to lock lips. That was yeah. a tough night. Well, they got the win, though. I don't know how long I was out, really. I, I've had people tell me I was, you know, might have been 10, 15, 20. I don't know. Yeah, it was, you yeah. know. But I, all the thing I know was I remember getting real dizzy. And knowing I needed to sit down, right? And, and then the next thing I remember was Jonesy getting ready to <laughs> lip lock. That's me. a tough night. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, a tough night. Yeah. But like you say, you got the win. Well, there's a couple other guys that you've told us about over, you know, over the course of the show. We do the old fashioned three right here on Stones Radio Networks, and uh, I'm going to bring up a couple of names. One of them was. I think the the impetus for one of your best pieces of advice, if if I have this right, Greg Kite, was a guy who did something you didn't particularly care for, and you kind of set him straight. Well, well, Greg's one of those guys, you know, played on the championship team with the Celtics, but obviously a very limited role player, and could do a couple things well. He would defensive rebound mm-hmm. quite well, big, and set great screens. You know, I mean, he sets the bonus like screens, right. Uh, as Big a shooter, seven, seven footer, seven yeah. footer, probably yeah. two seventy. Yeah. You know, strong guy. guys. I mean, didn't want to mess with him for, for sure, but he wasn't a quality shooter of the ball. <laughs> he did not. He did not he, stroke the rock. He did not have a great stroke, and as want would have it, we were playing the game, and <laughs> you know, we wanted certain things from Greg. You know, because we as you've you know, delineated what they yeah, are. Yes, yes, and all of a sudden, you know, Greg was open at eighteen feet and. He shot it. Well, he didn't make it. No, he didn't. And pretty soon, next play or so, I mean, a minute or let, he had another open 18-footer, and he shot it again. He was well, open. Yeah. He, yeah. And so I called a timeout, and I said, Greg, well, you know what you're doing? And he said, well, I was open. I said, of course you are. That's their strategy. <laughs> he figured, if I'm open, I'm taking the shot. Yeah, well, and I mean, you know, you'd like to believe <laughs> that can work, but it couldn't. You know, I mean, he just, you know, you, he could have had 20 shots. He might have made three. Well, that's not great. That isn't no. probably no. kind of what uh, feeds a bulldog. You so know what you're saying? saying you're basically saying there's a reason you're open. And, yeah. And it's for you not to shoot. Thank yeah. you very you, much. You are open. That is their strategy to get <laughs> you open. <laughs> I wanted to be in on some of your timeouts the way you tell them. It's fantastic. And another guy that you mentioned, as I remember back in the day, just, just one of the characters that you ran into as far as being on the Kings, and that was Brooks Steppy. I oh. know that you, you like Brooks Steppy. He was kind of one of your guys back in the day, or just well, an odd kind of fellow. Very odd kind yeah. of fellow. Uh, he was a rookie, I think his second year, actually, with the Kings when I came on board. He'd been a 16th pick, I think, out of Georgia yeah. Tech. Uh, Good college six, player. 6'5". Five, yeah. Tough, tough guy, you know, really competitive and strong. And, and of course, the thing, of course, he he was strange. I mean, he was a little strange. <laughs> he was but, strange. But he, I always remember when he, he'd be flying around and knocking the guys around. And, you know, he, he gave himself the nickname Combo. Combo. Because he's part Commando and Rambo. <laughs> <laughs> so call me Combo. Was he proud of that name? That's not the most... Uh, well, you know, uh, yeah. Like commando well, and Ram- Rambo. Well, I think he made it up, so yeah, nobody else go. came up yeah. with it. So, uh, yeah, I think he was. Well, and that was kind of who he was, you know. Yeah. And, I mean, we, you know, there came a point where we just didn't... I mean, Phil Johnson, the coach at the time, just said, we really don't need Combo. <laughs> We 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 we've got so an excess of combos. He didn't give you enough on the floor to offset what he was the, distraction, so yes, to speak. Yeah, yeah. and he yeah. probably was a good enough talent had he yeah maybe been a little less, you know, weird in some ways. Did you yeah. run into a lot of weird characters back in the '80s uh, NBA and maybe maybe up until today? But it just seemed like maybe there were more characters back then. Well, I think probably there were because. You know, there wasn't as much money involved. Yeah. And, you know, guys 
uh, you know, there weren't as many spots available and there wasn't many options right. available, whether it's uh, CBA at that time mm-hmm. or, or very few guys played overseas. So, you know, it's kind of a deal of we got out of college and we've got a few years to make it or not make right. it. Right. And yeah. so, yeah, I think it, it was a, well, a little different world in every way because, you know, the, you flew uh, commercial. Mm-hmm. Uh, you didn't have your own practice sites. Right. Uh, so you're getting seven footers and you're folding them into the regular yeah. seats on a commercial flight. Well, of yeah. course, see, on that, I, I learned early on. I mean, I'm a slow learner, but I learned early okay. on the pecking order because in <laughs> the in the NBA uh, at that time, veteran players, you know, when you flew commercial, they had the option. Basically, they got to take whatever first class seats there were. Okay. And so then rookies and all would – would have to take coach. Trying to fill in. Now, right. the difference is the rookies, they would get paid the difference, so a lot of them wanted to anyway. Oh, I see. So okay. they, yeah. So yeah. I always remember Michael Jackson, uh, you couldn't have made him fly first class. <laughs> he was one of that difference. <laughs> With huh? that extra money. <laughs> and, you know, he's, you know, I mean, that's what – and then, of course, uh, coaches flew coach. Now, was there a, a financial benefit to that as well? No. No, no just no. coaches flying coach. Flying. It's in the title. You're fly, flying coach. Uh, coaches coach. and trainers. Yeah, yeah. We, we'd get on and we'd move our butts right to the back, you know. And <laughs> I always said, in case you needed to, to realize the difference between college and pros, that was a good reminder. It's like, hi, guys. Hi, guys. I'll be back <laughs> I'll here. I'll see you in the back. Yeah, I'll be back here. Well, I, you, one story that you've told us in the, in the past uh, makes me – People don't understand sometimes that the, the the front office, the owners, don't always understand the nuts and bolts of the entire uh, NBA system. And you tell a story about a guy named Martin Nestle, uh, a, a big man, kind of an extra big man back in the day. And the way that you, your team, you were coaching at the time, I yeah. believe you were the head yeah. coach. And the way they had you employ Mr. Nestle was kind of, it, it kind of educated me on, on fact of how much people didn't know. Yeah, it was one of those deals where, uh, you know, Basically, it was the case where Martin Nestle had been a seven-footer, played at Duke, didn't play, but he was on Duke's on roster. Duke's roster at seven and, feet. And then, but Clippers kept him for a year, you know, in hopes, you know, as we all. He's going to. He's develop. a big, You never know with a big man. You never know. Yeah, and, you and, never and, know. In, and in those days, you know, you always had to have big people. That was really something you had to have. So, make a long story short, we had some injuries, and we were, you know, getting near the end of the year. And you have to have so many on your roster. Minimum roster. And you, number, so yeah. you have to sign 10 days or whatever that. And so, you know, it's in a in a pinch. You know, it's like we've got a game coming up. We don't have enough guys. To, <laughs> so you to, just need a to, body. We need a body. Yeah. You know, and it's something that you, you know, could say, well, he played for the Clippers. You know, right. that sort of thing. You know, not you weren't fooling yourself. No. He, he was available in 24 hours. Yeah. And and we had a game in 24 hours, <laughs> <laughs> so so we we signed him to a 10 day, and uh, of course you know he really didn't make a great contribution. Not a big difference. And we weren't expecting that, but I was like say I always remember Jim Thomas, the owner at that time. I had really didn't bother to call him about it. I just didn't think that it was important, <laughs> or I needed to get his approval and, to add a guy in a 10 day. Right? Yeah, 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 and uh, but he was upset. You know, said you, you know, you should have called me, and I should have. I would have, you know, just like, come on, yeah. You I'll have to add a player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. And I mean, if I'd, have, but then I would say the classic though was, okay, we. How many more games will we win with him? <laughs> I said, none. <laughs> so he's mad at you for not calling, and now he wants to know what yeah, impact and, this guy's yeah, going to have. And in those days, too, you know, the, the minimums were so low. I mean, I think he cost us ten, twelve thousand dollars $12,000. Yeah. You know. I mean, you know, it's nothing. Hey, it's nothing. Yeah. Nobody care about it. Uh, but he's still worried about how many games it's going to. You know, what's he going to do to my bottom line? Yeah. Right? What you know? What? How's he going to impact the team? Well, he's going to impact because you put a jersey on, and <laughs> and now we have enough guys to play the game. Yeah, and he can warm up and, and hurt, hopefully not hurt anybody. So, base. Sometimes the guys at the top don't really know what what happens with the guys on the floor. So, uh, fantastic, Jared. One more thing, Larry Bird. Obviously, you're associated with Larry from French Lick and everything. You've told us many great stories. It's best, but now you were originally, and we talked about his grandfather already today. But mm-hmm. wasn't it Larry's older brother that you originally were were better friends with? Yeah, his, his oldest brother Mark uh, was uh, played a little. He was uh, let's see, he was several years behind me, but I knew he was a very good player. Played college division, and then uh, of course Larry was. I had a younger brother, Randy, who since passed, it was in Larry's class. Okay. 
And so, you know, and, and I mean, it's a small town. So, you know, I always kind of knew who Larry was. You know, I'd, you know, we'd play in outdoor courts and there and Mark and other mm-hmm. pl- good players. And there, and there'd be little Larry hanging around, you know. And At that time, little Larry? Yeah, yeah, yeah he was little Larry. And he'd go, Get out of here, you know. <laughs> You know, don't don't bother players. Come on, Larry, you don't belong in this game. <laughs> well, he was, you know, six, seven years old or something like that. But I mean. still, you could tell even then. Come on. <laughs> no, I couldn't. No, no, no. He was a he was a late developer. I always said, you know, first time I'd saw him play in high school, he was a junior, and he was six three, one hundred and sixty mm-hmm. pounds, and uh, they had a really good high school team, and you know, a couple other guys played college off that team. But I remember telling this coach, you know, I said, this guy, this guy's going to be best to ever come out of here. He said, oh, geez, he's, you know, he's a pain in the ass, blah, 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 which I'm sure he was. <laughs> he definitely was. But I said, I'd never seen, and, you know, a guy pass like that, you know, which I think is always a part of his game that's most So underrated. he just he just had that when he, he had went it. high I mean, school. I mean, he really. Just, I mean, the it vision was and the and the pass the and the willingness to pass. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he just well, he made everybody better. Yeah, even then. even then, yeah, even then. And of course, the next year he goes grows to six seven, mm. and you know, averages I think thirty three and twenty, and then you know, and then goes to Indiana, and then you really like the experience and drops out right. for a year, grows another two inches or a little more probably. So ends up at about six nine then, a little six, over six yeah, nine yeah, I think, yeah. and then of course Indiana State and the rest is. Rest is still history. history. I, I always remember riding a garbage truck with him one time. The year he was out of out of college, uh, he he worked on the maintenance department of mm-hmm. the French Lick in West Baden there, and I was on my way to Rockhurst to to change jobs, and so I just was driving through to spend time in French Lick. Right. So I thought, well. You know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. I, you know, I'd say, go talk to Larry. He said, you know. You never it? know. You just yeah. never know. Well, and really, I wasn't really trying to recruit him to, right. to Rockers because I knew it wouldn't fit too far from home. Yeah. You, you know what I mean? be close, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just it wouldn't, uh, you know, and it's in a city. It wouldn't have worked. So he was a regional celebrity at the time, too. It just he got a little bit bigger as time went on. He got a lot bigger. Yeah. And, uh, but anyway, I, I just wanted to talk to him about, you know, re- encourage him to go back to college. Right. And, and and he said, no, I made my mind up. You know, I am going to go back. And he said, you know, Indiana State, which is 70 miles from French Lick. So it you was know. in his area. Oh yeah, yeah. It was yeah. it was close enough. For Very it close. Yeah, about maybe a little further than Bloomington, but not not a lot. Yeah, and he's considered. I think I was thinking about this the other day. He's considered one of the best, obviously one of the best players of all time, but also one of the best uh, small forwards. But I think maybe that's uh, that designation with you know he had McHale on his team, so he's kind of the f- small forward. But was he one of the first stretch forwards that we've ever seen? Well, he. I mean, he had the shot to bring well, people away. Well, he could. Uh, yeah. He, I mean, really, his, I think his best position was a three. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, it's a, probably the first big, long three that, oh, that could shoot the three ball. Uh, he'd, although in those days he didn't shoot a lot of it, but he, he was terrific. At, you know, he was a 50, 40, 90 guy several yeah, you, times. You don't run across that many yeah, of those. Yeah, there's no, very few guys that have done that. Nine, but, certainly. But, uh, yeah, and then, you know, he he rebounded like a power forward. Or better, and then assist. He assisted like yeah. a is <laughs> like a point guard. I mean, really, I, I think that was. I always said, you know, you watch highlights of Larry in his prime, and it's his passing that you right. know is just way better than than people realize. You know, they that's a kind of a skill, unless it's a Magic Johnson or somebody. I mean, Rick Barry is the same way. Kind yeah, of. Rick Barry. Rick Barry. You know, you don't have the great instincts. Yeah, incredible yeah. passer and stuff. Yeah, and you guys kept. I mean, you and Larry kept. You know, throughout the years, kept close or kept in kept touch, in, everything. Kept but touch. he also, uh, as we prepare to wrap up here, he also didn't take it easy on you when he was playing against your team. He did not, uh, and I know that's very surprising to people <laughs> that uh, he, he kind made, of had his French he made buddy. A, you know, yeah, he uh, had no real, real sympathy for another <laughs> French Lickian, and uh, managed to pound us uh, any chance he got. And uh, you know, that's but that's who he was. But I, he had always, you know. T- I mean, he was a great trash talker, and he'd always, yeah. he, he always knew how to bust your chops, you know. I mean, he, I was just like say about the last one of the last games I coached, we were playing the Celtics, and, and we were ahead at the half, and, and really it became a, went down to the overtime, I think. Yeah. But, but Larry was having a bad first half, and I, I knew 
you know, I said, I ain't going to look at the blankety blank or say nothing. You, know, <laughs> you I'm not, want to trash talk? No, you're not going to no, do that. No, I ain't saying nothing. No. And I told my assistant, the assistant, you know, I <laughs> the said, one you had, I said right. you know, don't let me look at him and don't, you know, don't, you know. And it, well, of course, sure enough, he comes out of the tunnel, walks by our bench, and 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 just stands there a little bit till he gets my, till I <laughs> happen to look, look up and he said, you know I'm gonna kick your ass, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> and you know I didn't say that, but I, I said, yeah, I know. <laughs> I did, you know. It's just like one of those things. It's like, okay. <laughs> now I know you told me uh, once uh, about how you know he knew your plays so well that he made a prediction before the game started. Yeah, we were. That was when uh, I was in the front office and. Uh, Larry had been out the house the night before, and, uh, you know, we're having a hot toddy uh, or two. Have a hot a uh, toddy or two. And really, Dick Mata was a coach, and Dick was really a very structured coach, really had plays that yes. he ran all the time, loved them. And, but, you know, most, about everybody knew what they were. Everybody in the uh, league, yeah. Now, at least coaches, but probably most players would get. But, a, but Larry told me, he said, well, I, you know, I know this play. I don't know what to call it. He said, you know, I know where you sit early. <laughs> I know where you sit. You know, because I sit at the, in the end zone. Yeah. And he said, you know, when they run that play, I'm going to steal the damn ball. <laughs> He's and, telling you this over a couple of toddies. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and she said, I'm going to steal the ball, and I'm going to turn around and look at you. <laughs> and, and that's, it. you know, with about six minutes gone in the game, that, you know, they ran it, and he yeah. stole the damn ball. <laughs> and just for about five, seemed, seemed like an hour. Yeah. But it was really a couple seconds. He just turned held the ball. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, as I was say, that's, you know, what most people don't know about the greats, uh, you know, m m many of the greats, is that their understanding of the game. Yeah, they was, talk about basketball IQ, but well, we really have no idea. No, what, you have no idea. Yeah. I mean, where they know, they just instinctively know yeah. the plays, of what has to happen on plays, yeah. things of that nature, you know. Uh, certainly the Magics and the Stocktons and, and you know, I mean, you go down through the yeah. years. I mean, Jokic, I think you put, you he know. He has that now, yes. has that real real knack. I mean, that's just Chris Paul. I mean, there, you know, there's guys that are different. Yeah, absolutely different. Well, Jerry, you're different. I want to thank you for uh, sitting down with me today and being on the talk show. It's been a pleasure, and I, I really thank you a lot. Well, appreciate you having me on the – on the uh, Phantom Phantom Talk Show, Phantom Talk Show, <laughs> and uh, it's been an honor. And you know, as you know, we like talking basketball. We That's... certainly do. Thanks to Jerry Reynolds for being here. Thanks to Stones McCoy uh, behind the glass, and thanks to you for watching. This is the Phantom Talk Show. We'll talk to you next time.